Welcome to Charting New Paths from Pre-K-12 Education, a podcast by Solution Tree. In our author segment, we invite our new and best-selling authors published by Solution Tree to share their expertise and valuable insights with you. Listen to this segment and add another tool in your toolbox of research-affirmed classroom-ready strategies to improve student outcomes. I'm your host, Prisma Lopez Marine. Enjoy today's episode. Hello, everyone. In today's episode, the book we're going to be talking about is called Dismantling a Broken System, Actions to Bridge the Opportunity, Equity, and Justice Gap in American Education. This book has such great information to initiate actions for change. It reflects on our history, breaks down specific areas where influence is visible, and addresses the reader with actions that can take place. We are joined by the author of this book, Zach Wright. He's not only written about these matters, but also has taken his own actions to creating opportunities for students, such as establishing college uh, scholarship opportunities for under underrepresented students, and much more. Zach, thank you for joining us for this episode. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure. So first, um, can you share with us your current role as an educator and then your previous role in pre-K through 12 um, education? Sure. Uh, I am currently uh, an assistant professor of practice at Relay Graduate School of Education, uh, serving Philadelphia and Camden. So essentially, uh, folks who want to get into teaching uh, but did not go to undergrad for teaching, this is a pathway towards certification uh, and a pathway to becoming an effective educator quickly. Uh, so I serve, uh, I teach those students and I observe them and coach them, advise them. Um, that's my current role in addition to some of the uh, activism work I do on the side. Uh, my prior life was uh, just over uh, 10 years as a high school English teacher in West Philadelphia, uh, eight years of which were at Mastery Charter Shoemaker Campus, where I taught the first eight graduating classes. Um, and that's where I really cut my teeth as an educator and learned so much from those students and those families in that community uh, in general. Yeah, that's a lot. That's a lot that you do and that you continue to do. Um, also, can you, um, you mentioned about taking action in your own hands in the past. And uh, can you tell us more about what you saw that guided you to help establish college scholarships for underrepresented students? Sure. Um, so I went to the University of Vermont, uh, and it's a place that is very special to me. Um, met my wife there, met some amazing people there. It's just it's a very special place to me. And um, when I was teaching, I just had the idea, like, what if UVM... Uh, was an option. And um, it all started with an email. And the first couple of years, I would take uh, a van load of students up to Vermont, and we would drive up there and they would spend two days there kind of as students, um, kind of getting the lay of the land and, and, and seeing what it would like to be a student. Um, the first couple of years, though, it became very obvious, though, that even though there was a select couple of students who were very interested and were very capable and very able, they weren't, um, they, they, it was not a financially viable option for them. And that didn't seem right to me. Uh, particularly as someone I never thought about paying for college growing up. I grew up in a relatively uh, wealthy household and just college was the assumed next step. And so the lesson I learned from this whole thing is if you just keep agitating and just keep asking, eventually you'll probably get the, the answer you want. And what we were able to create is a scholarship by which um, every year up to five students from mastery schools in Philadelphia and Camden are offered uh, near full ride scholarships to UVM every year. And so we've had about five graduates now. We have about 15 students there currently, and it's ongoing in perpetuity. Uh, so a lot of what I talk about in the book is very what I call hyper-local activism. And that's one example uh, of making very small change that's not going to make headlines anywhere, but makes very small incremental changes in, in, in minute communities, but the ripples extend outward. So that was one of the things we were able to do, and, and I'm really proud of it. 
No, and, and you should be. Um, anybody, I, my own mentors, when I was looking at the book, I was like I'm reflecting on my own mentors and everything that you've accomplished, people still have. Um, n- not only is it your name attached to it, but it's also the, the impact you had as a person on them, on your students, on the um, even your own peers who are part of implementing this scholarship. Um, it's, it's an influence um, for everybody. Um, so then also, um, you've also taken uh, action towards equitable education funding um, specific to what the book says about testifying before Philadelphia's Board of Education. That's so serious. <laughs> In the Pennsylvania State Capitol. Um, can you tell us more about that? Sure. Um, well, again, as I just learned, started to learn more and more about why things the way they are, which is really a lot of what the book is about. It's just saying, like, here's why things are the way they are. Um, I began to learn that there are so many ways to agitate for change. So at the local level, the Philadelphia School Board, it was agitating for um, maintaining school choice opportunities for families for high high performing uh, charter schools. Uh, so that was a way of ensuring choice for all. Very often, folks who may come out as against school choice actually exercise choice for their own families. So it was about ex- in- ensuring choice for for all families for quality education. Uh, At the state level, it was more agitating for equitable state funding across the board. There is actually currently a a Supreme Court case being argued in Pennsylvania right now for these funding formulas. Um, So it was kind of throwing our weight behind that as well. Um, More recently, um, when COVID first hit, I organized a day of action to agitate for um, universal internet access, particularly in Philadelphia. Uh, Comcast is headquartered in uh, Philadelphia, and yet when COVID first hit, uh, many, many students and teachers had to go to parking lots to access Wi-Fi. And that's an egregious injustice. So we organized a National Day of Action to agitate for that, to get more universal access to internet. And then even more locally, uh, to where I live, a small town in Southern New Jersey, we agitated for um, to, to really address our disciplinary disparities by race and special education. Um, all of these things I talk about in the book as, as all of these things are accessible for everyone. Um, you know, I am not a special person. We, 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 the, the, the data is there, the agitation is there, and thanks to social media and all these things, the ability to agitate is there. Um, so those are just some of the things we've been working on, and what we're working on in the future is diversifying the teacher pipeline into all of uh, all districts, as well as getting rid of some of the blocks that uh, maintain. Uh, getting getting rid of some of the roadblocks towards teaching as a diversified and incentivized profession. Yeah, yeah, that's that's a good point. Definitely, um, the whole pandemic. Um, I saw that. I mean, everybody did. Everybody heard about just like the the capacity and the fact that our students and our teachers are just not just you know throwing away like their day and saying oh we can't just make it we're not going to do this they literally were in parking lots and in trying to get um continue their education because uh, one of the things that i did notice um that that was mentioned um was actually about um, education is a ladder of social mobility um that really stuck to me and i know that um as an adult but you don't know that um as a student and and then also like how much I don't know if the, that it really influences teachers when they see their students. Am I able to help them? Can you tell us about your experience with students that uh, perhaps made an impact for you to write the book? Sure. I mean, there are, I know every teacher is going to say this, but there are literally so many. Like when, when you say, can you think of students? My mind is just like flooded with students and moments and experiences. The one that I write about in the book and the, actually the, the introduction to the book um, I changed the student's name, but uh, the, the name I used in the book is her name is Aisha. And um, what we did uh, for seniors is we it was called uh, the family financial fit meetings. And essentially what we would do is uh, around March, uh, we would have, I, I taught seniors, we'd have seniors come in with members of their family to sit down for a financial fit meeting for their uh, post high school options. So essentially, uh, the students had all of their college acceptances, all of their financial aid award letters, uh, all their loans, grants, all these things that, that they could do. We popped it into a spreadsheet 
And students were able to look at their options and say, okay, this school, I, would, I have to come out of pocket this much, this school, I have to come out of pocket this much, et cetera. Because the last thing we wanted to do was students to make uninformed uh, decisions that could impact their financial well-being for the rest of their lives. Um, so we're sitting down with Aisha. It was actually 5.30 in the morning because we had these morning meetings for, for working families. And um, Aisha was an incredible student. Um, a student I certainly was not uh, in high school. She had all the internships, all the extracurriculars, like a 3.8 GPA, just high test score, like all the things, right? She was extraordinary, a model student. And she got accepted into schools. Um, her EFC, Estimated finan Family Contribution on the FAFSA for the federal financial aid, was $0. So her family did not have money, a lot of money. They worked so hard and just didn't have a lot. Um, even with all of that, the least expensive school for her uh, was over $10,000 out of pocket a year. Mm -hmm. And that is simply unreachable mm -hmm. for her, for that family. And because of that, she couldn't access the schools she deserved access to. She had earned access to. And therefore, her only option left was Community College of Philadelphia, which is a great institution full of extremely hardworking people mm -hmm. that also has a dropout rate of over 90%. And that's what happened to Aisha. I remember leaving that meeting, finally understanding that everything is rigged, that it's rigged from the get-go. Because... I didn't think about who was going to pay for my college education at all. I just knew that that's where I was going to go after school, after high school. Um, we as a nation deprioritize education. We, dis we, we disinvest in our children because if we had a student like Aisha who could do such amazing things, but then was just not allowed access because she couldn't afford it. Not only are we doing a gross injustice to her and her family, we're doing a gross injustice to our society as a whole, because who knows what she could have done? Who knows what she could have solved or figured out? And that moment changed me a lot. Um, now, as I say that, that's kind of humbling because it's like, that's what I needed to wake up. I shouldn't have needed that to wake up. But that being said, that's what I needed to wake up. Um, so what I started to do is I started to learn and started to read and started to realize that these things are, these things don't just happen. Uh, these things are products of a system by its design. Very often you'll hear the system is broken or the system is not working. And again, indeed, that's the title of the book. But in many ways, the system is not broken. In many ways, the system is working precisely how it's been designed. And when we think about that and we look about how these things, why things are the way they are, which is what the book goes into, then we can start thinking about, okay, if this is how things are the way they are, what makes them so, then here are some of the ways we can work to change them. And that's what uh, a lot of the book is about as well. Wow, that's, that's very true. Um, I like that um, reflection for of the student. I know, like you said, you have so many and you did meet so many different um, stories, different backgrounds, but it's certainly, um, there's resonation in the influence that that provided for you um, as an educator as a as a individual person. Um, so I'm assuming being an educator certainly provides the insider's perspective of um, everything that can be done but doesn't or hasn't just taken place yet, um, depending on the school. Uh, is a book supposed to help initiate change? Yes, in many different ways. So when I think about what this book is and who this book is for, it, it's for a lot of different people, many different ways. First and foremost, it's for everybody who just wants to figure out, like, why do we do schooling this way? What, how is this organized? So that's the first thing for, for people who just want to know, like, why are schools the way they are? So that's kind of the first audience. Second audience is teachers both new and experienced who want to like push themselves. So in their own classroom level, how can they do, how can they reflect on their own practice and say, 
where is the oppressor within me? Bettina Love in her fantastic book, You Want to Do More Than Survive, uh, she, she writes that there is the oppressor within all of us. And if we want to be true abolitionist educators, we need to find that and interrogate that and, and work with that. Um, so there are very practical exercises in the book that get teachers to reflect on their daily practice to push themselves towards abolitionist teaching with the understanding that this is not a box to check or a PD to take. This is lifelong work. Yeah. At the larger level, there are ways for district leaders or school leaders to look at their school holistically using data to identify areas of injustice, be it um, disciplinary disparities, funding disparities, et cetera, and then go to agitate for change at that level. And then at the state level, there are ways to agitate for funding uh, for funding measures to address inequitable funding um, disparities. A lot of these are start with data collection. There are in there are numerous public free data sets available online that everyone can look at to dive into what is actually going on in our schools. What is actually the reality? And while data does not tell a whole story, it does tell a story, and it's a beginning. So that's one way to start. One of the other things the book does is is it, it's one of the things I'm most interested to see what it does, if anything, um, is interrogates the idea of what we mean by when we say good school. Um, very often, folks of who are capable move to a place for a good school. And whenever I hear that, I always say, what's good mean? What does good mean? And often, it the conversation ends to one of two ways. One and saying, you know what, I don't know what good means. Or if someone's a little bit more honest, uh, they might say, it means someplace I feel comfortable, which means that it's people who look like me. Um, there's a whole bit that interrogates that idea. What do we mean by good? Like, what does that mean? Um, so that's who the book is for, which is, in short is for everybody, but does really kind of center in for folks who want to learn about the system, which is anybody, teachers who want to make sure that they are pushing themselves in the classroom level, and then school and district leaders who can think, how can I push the system to really ensure justice for all of uh, all of our children? Okay, that makes sense. Um, I also did really like how the book just describes um, teachers and for taking action, setting norms to work together in what you just talked about. Um, can you tell us more about the section of training culturally responsive teachers? The idea, for, first off, you're going to run into a lot of folks now who say that that's not necessary or not needed. Um what they're really saying is that they just want the status quo to remain. And what that really means is that they don't care about kids who don't look like them. Culturally responsive teaching means lots of things. One of the ways I take it to mean is you are ensuring loving, rigorous quality education for all of your students by knowing who your students are and viewing who they are and where they come from as assets, not deficits. So there are a lot of things there. And there are a lot, there's a lot of work to do with that. One of the um, exercises that we do is called an eye audit. So here's a very quick example. So let's say, and I do this with my teachers. So let's say we come together and I say, go to a fresh piece of paper. I'm not going to give you 15 seconds. I want you to write down every student you can think of. Go. 15 seconds. And they write, they write, they write, they write, they write. That's okay. Let's look at those students. Who are those students that you wrote down? For almost every teacher, they are either the students who are amazing or the students who are, give them the most trouble. Mm -hmm. So then I say, okay, what students didn't you name? And those are all the students who are fine. They're there. They don't really raise their hand, so they're forgotten. So then I say, okay, I want you to put a plus next to all the students you gave a positive affirmation to and a, ne and a, a negative, a subtraction, next to every student you gave a negative reinforcement to. 
And what teachers start to see is that the same students all the time get negative or positive reinforcement. And that is one sure way to change absolutely nothing. And that gets teachers to see it, to say, this is, wow, like, I haven't said one positive thing to that kid oh, in goodness. days, in weeks. So why would that kid come into my classroom and all of a sudden be better? Right. Why, would, why would that be? That's one of the many examples you go through in the book. They're simple. But what they do is they illuminate things. They get mm -hmm. you to pause and step back. And one of the reasons that's so hard for educators is because they have a million and one things to do and no time to do them. In. So it's hard to take this time. But when you do that, you start to see the things and the things are obvious. And then you can start make daily changes in, in your practice that can really, really make huge impacts. And, and I, often, I always tell my teachers this, and it's from Lisa Delpit, other people's children. Um, every child in front of you is not, is just a student. That's a part of their identity, but they are someone's baby. Right. They're someone's baby. Yeah. And if you forget that you have forgotten the core humanity of education. I'm a parent. I have two boys. I never want my, their teachers to forget that they are my babies. And I am a loving, supportive parent and a partner with my school. But as soon as any injustice happens, like the papa bear and the mama bear is going to come out as well they should. Um, so that's one of the things that we talk about with our teachers, just ways, ways to step back and reflect and identify, again, as Bettina Love says, the oppressor within to become a more culturally responsive educator. So also, it's really interesting to me um, how these matters are not just something that needs to be talked about within the school walls, but it's also, like you said, community-wide, um, county-wide, statewide, nationwide. And you did touch about this. Um, so can you talk more about like the issues of underfunded schools uh, facing? And then also your book did touch on how um, underfunded schools are pit against each other. I didn't, I didn't even think about that. Sure. So, so the vast majority of schools in this country are funded based upon their property value of the local uh, residential area. So essentially, if a neighborhood of low property tax value has correspondingly a lower resourced dis district than a higher property tax value, neighborhood. Um, in Pennsylvania, for example, uh, the classic example is Philadelphia, um, is a portions roughly 15, 14 or $15,000 per student. If you cross City Line Avenue to the west, you go to Lower, Lower Marion, which is a wealthy uh, suburb. Uh, they, uh, they give $28,000 per student. That's based upon property tax value. That is a baked in self-perpetuating system of injustice because not only are some students getting almost double the other students, but the students that are getting less are actually, you could argue the students not don't deserve more, but need more. Because if I am growing up in a neighborhood that is living in poverty, I am more likely to be exposed to traumatic experiences as a child. And if I am growing up with a traumatic experience as a child, that changes my brain. A book called The Body Keeps the Score uh, that goes into all of this. That student, therefore, doesn't need this, the same supports. They need greater supports. But those supports aren't available because of the baked in inequities of the funding system. This goes even deeper when you combine this with the injustice of residential segregation. So, and I go into this in the book as well, the Federal Housing Authority or administration in the 1930s and 40s, they released these maps, these residential maps. This is a, a must read book is, book is The Color of Law. Um, essentially these books color coded areas, residential areas, based upon the safety or danger of offering mortgages to families. What we see therefore are white areas 
received mortgages at exponentially greater rates than the so-called red areas, which were for Black, Latino, and in the early days, uh, Jewish and other um, other non-white Christian entities. So what you see is a generational head start because mortgages are the ways, and well, residential ownership is the way American families generate their wealth in general. And so if you have families that were able to generate wealth in the 20s and the 30s and the 40s, but family other families weren't able to generate that wealth until the 80s or 90s or even today, then what you see, some families are able to move up into neighborhoods that are wealthier, have higher property taxes, and therefore have more greater resource schools, whereas other families are not able to. So they are renting, not generating equity. They are renting in lower income areas, which has lower property taxes and therefore less resource schools. And the system continues. So once that's the fundamental thing that needs to change. Education in this country, if you really want to really name it, education in this country is a commodity. It is not a public good. It is a commodity that is bought by everybody. It is bought by everybody, not people who just go to private school or Catholic school, everybody. Because as soon as you look up a house to buy, you see square footage, you see bedrooms and bathrooms, and you see school zone. So you are buying access to the school. What that means is those you can those who can afford get and those who cannot don't. So when we think about the broken system, that's the fundamental thing that has to change. Um, and then just lastly, when we spoke before, you mentioned that an individual educator can certainly take steps towards uh, making an influence and then, you know, generating an impact. I really like what you said, a tidal wave for change. Um, is this book for everybody, like you said, who aims for that change? Teachers, leadership, parents. Um, I was thinking specifically, like, I could definitely see parents looking at this book and being like, oh, like, this is... Um, a lot of things that are, are these things being taken care of? And then also community-wise, like our, like the education board um, and all of the people who, um, a lot of these matters that you speak in the, in the book are not just within the school walls. It's a whole, it's a community. Yeah. Um, this, and I mentioned this in, this in the book, this stuff can get overwhelming quick. And that overwhelmingness can lead to, being paralyzed and just throwing, throwing, saying, you know, throwing your hands up in the air. There are three quotes I think of. One is from the Talmud, um, which which talks about. Uh, again, I'm, I'm not going to be able to do it verbatim, but pretty much says you are not required to see the end of the work, but you are there. But you are also not required to stop the work. You're not going to. We're not going to see the end. We're not going to see the end of the of end of the end of the road. But we are still obligated to walk it. The other quote, another quote I think about is Malcolm X, uh, who said, sad, again, paraphrasing, sadness doesn't do anything. Mm -hmm. Anger does something. People don't do things when they get sad. They do things when they get angry. So a lot, when I write this book, a lot, when I was writing the book, some people were like, you might need to tamp down the anger a little bit. And I was like, no, because I want this book to be angering because that's when people do something. And the last quote I think about is Frederick Douglass. Um, in a perhaps apocryphal story, he was asked what by, by a young person, what should I do with my life? And his answer was agitate, agitate, agitate. And I take that to mean just don't stop. Right. Keep making a nuisance of yourself. Um, very often, especially with social media, you get the sense that if you aren't making headlines, you aren't making an impact. And that's not true. Uh, I'm a very strong believer in hyper-local activism and that everyone has their own change to make and they can be minute, absolute minute change. The image I think of is a pond uh, and everyone has a little stone. And if everyone throws their stone in the pond, it makes those ripples extend outward. And if everyone does their little bit, those ripples become tidal waves. And, and that's how change comes. So when I think of what this book can do, mm -hmm. I don't anticipate, 
you know, huge headlines across the world, right? But if it empowers a couple of teachers, a couple of school leaders, a couple of parents, a couple of families to dive into some data, Mm -hmm. find the injustice and then agitate for change, then maybe we got some stuff going. Um, So that's the purpose. Absolutely. Um, and it does, it does serve that purpose, um, uh, from what I've read and it certainly, um, can provide that impact, um, by, by reading it, by participating in within the book with the reflective, um, reflection questions. And then also, um, sharing, sharing this content, like you said, um, providing that, um, this, this book has that, um, essence of wanting to ultimately, because this is for our next generations, our current, what we're doing currently now, and then as educators also, but, um, this is for the future as well. Um, and like you said, I really like that. I've, I, I really, I've never heard that quote before, but I, I really, really like that. Uh, we are not going to see the change. Um, and I hadn't really thought of that because we think we're invisible. We're going to be here forever, but we're not. Um, but everything that you've done in this book and everything that you've already accomplished um, yourself uh, has already created that crease. Um, so um, I can, because I looked into um, your background and, and everything else, and I'm just like, wow, this is, um, and he's only getting started, I'm assuming. <laughs> so <laughs> I, I, I hope, I mean, I hope I'll be here for a, a, a while longer and uh, continue to make a nuisance of myself. No, it's good. It's good impact. Zach, thank you so much for this conversation about these significant and very important matters um, that um, have had serious impact in our history, but with valuable influences such as this book and your expertise, um, we can make uh, continue to have conversations and actions towards positive change. I Here's hoping. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. No, thank you. We appreciate you being with us. Thank you. This book is certainly another tool for your toolbox with teaching and learning how educators can start or continue to take actions and provide a great environment for all students. This book is available on the Solution Tree website, solutiontree.com. Just look for Dismantling a Broken System. At Solution Tree, we share your vision to transform education to ensure learning for all and we can help you make this vision a reality no other professional learning company provides our unique blend of research-based results-driven services that improve learning outcomes for students thank you for tuning in and check us out at solutiontree.com slash podcasts